Hello and good morning or good afternoon. Welcome to our fifth Ask Tom Office Hours session for Spatial and Graph. Uh, today we'll focus on a language for graphs, PGQL. My name is Jean Im. I'm a product manager for Oracle Spatial and Graph products. And today we have uh, two experts uh, are on board to present the topic to you. First, uh, Albert Godfriend is our Spatial and Graph Solutions Architect, dialed in today from Nice, France, as usual. Um, Albert does travel across Europe and the Middle East uh, pretty extensively as well to work with our customers and partners and delivering sessions and workshops on both spatial and graph technologies. So good afternoon, Albert. And um, and uh, with me here in California on the West Coast is Oscar Van Rest. Uh, we're very pleased to have Oscar for his uh, debut on uh, Ask Tom, but uh, he's no stranger to presenting. He's a member of the Oracle Spatial and Graph development team. His focus is on the design of property graph query language, which is our subject for today. And he's also very actively involved in ongoing industry standardization efforts for graph query languages. Uh, so welcome, Oscar. Hello. <laughs> so um, a few housekeeping notes for participants before we start. Uh, Everyone's lines are muted, so please use the chat to ask your questions. Uh, the main goal of Ask Tom Office Hours is to answer your questions and help you with your development efforts, so don't be shy. Uh, we'll be monitoring that throughout the session, and we'll try our best to address all your questions. Uh, but do remember that we can't discuss any SRs, bug reports, or licensing issues on the session. Uh, and just remember that if you do post code into the chat, remember everyone can see that unless you direct it specifically to the hosts. Uh, so today is our fifth Ask Tom sessions in a series that we have on property graphs uh, for developers. Uh, we're covering topics to help you quickly get started using graphs in both your database and big data-based applications. Our previous sessions, if you missed them, are all recorded and available. If you missed any of them, uh, check out the Spatial and Graph Ask Time landing page at the URL on the screen. In previous sessions, we've um, learned about what property graphs are, how to model graphs from relational data, how to analyze graphs, and how to view graphs. And now we move on to the topic of how to query graphs with a query language called PGQL. This is an expressive declarative language that users of SQL will find very easy to use. And again, you can always go back to the Ask Tom landing page for recordings, resources, and past sessions to submit any feedback or topic requests uh, to our team. And you can view and sign up for future sessions there as well. Uh, so I'll just briefly recap the story so far. Uh, and again, you can check out video recordings if you missed any detailed topics. Oracle has two software products that support graphs. We have Oracle Big Data Spatial and Graph that manages data in a big data environment such as Hadoop, NoSQL, or HBase. And we also have Oracle Spatial and Graph for managing and analyzing graphs in a relational database environment. Both are available on premises and in the cloud. Here's the architecture of our property graph database support from the bottom up. At the bottom, we provide highly scalable, performant, and secure storage. And you have a choice to use either Oracle Relational Database 12.2 or 18.1, or big data stores like Apache HBase and Oracle NoSQL Database. In the middle, we have a storage management layer, and this is a Java layer that allows application developers to query, fetch, or filter database from the database. So think of this like a JDBC layer. And on top, to analyze the data, we have a powerful parallel in-memory graph analytics engine. This reads graph data from storage very efficiently into an in-memory data structure, and it includes 50 analytical functions for graph analytics right out of the box. Um, 
you can define and run queries on your graph data without being an expert in graph algorithms. And on the, as you see on the side, we have several interfaces for developers or users, Java, Groovy, Python, um, and we also support uh, REST and, and web services. And as mentioned, we have a powerful query language called PGQL, which supports declarative expressive queries, which will be our focus for today. So a fresher on what, what is a graph? It's a data model that represents entities as vertices and relationships as ed edges. You can include attributes on that as well. This is a very flexible data model. Uh, so it's a great alternative uh, to where relational models uh, sometimes fall short or are cumbersome. Um, there's no predefined schema. It's easily extensible. And when you have sparse data sets, it's particularly useful. But the power here is that it enables new kinds of analytics based on relationships that relational technologies find cumbersome to handle. Um, oops, looks like we jumped ahead a little bit. Um, okay, great. Uh, and graph analytics can provide insights like identifying the most influential customers in a social network or identifying uh, patterns of fraudulent behavior uh, in a criminal network or among um, uh, financial uh, transaction agents, or it can generate um, fine-grained recommendation engines for uh, retail systems. And graphs are increasingly being used in industries like banking, finance, public sector, intelligence, retail, and manufacturing. Uh, so today, Albert will show you how to execute PGQL from various environments. And then Oscar will take us deeper into what the language is all about and what you can do with it. And again, uh, feel free to an ask any questions you have along the way in the chat, and I'll hand things over to Albert. Thank you, Jean. Um, so yeah, today we'll, we'll actually go and uh, look at PGQL from two aspects. I'm going to be very brief. I'm just going to uh, highlight how we actually execute PGQL. This would be like in SQL, uh, how do I use JDBC to submit uh, um, SQL statements? And then Oscar is going to tell us what PGQL can do, what is it all about, and, uh, how, and demonstrate how powerful it is. So executing PGQL will be very short. For you, those of you who followed uh, our previous session, not the last one, it was on visu visualization, but the one before about analytics, you know that to actually do an analytics uh, from the in-memory analytics engine, the application will invoke an API. That API is a Java API. It's, however, exposed through Java, of course, but also through Groovy, through, uh, through Python, through R. But in all steps, in all cases, there, there are a number of steps that you have to go through, like get an instance between connection to the PGX engine, set up a session so that you are isolated from other users doing similar things, and then get an analyst. And the analyst is the one that is going to do all the work. So we also need to read the graph in memory. Now here we will call that method called read graph properties. That doesn't mean it's going to read the graph itself. The graph may have been read by another session that is sharing the graph, or the graph might also be read automatically when the graph, uh, the memory analytics engine server starts. And then analyst.pagerank will, for example, call a pagerank function. To run PGQL will be PG, so the uh, property graph uh, handle, query PGQL, passing the PGQL as a string. Again, very, very much like uh, JDBC. Much like JDBC. And uh, now the PG, um, the, so the, the query PGQL uh, method of the property graph gets a string. Now here we see an example of a, of a PGQL string. I'm not going to go through what this does. Oscar will explain this all to you, but you see it is already, it is very much SQL-like. It is select, that's familiar. There's an order by, that's familiar. What is less familiar to you probably is the match close. That, that's the really hard of PGQL. That's what expresses a graph traversal expression. Um, that will produce a result set, and the result set itself has a print method, which very nicely types out the result as we see it here on the, on, on the screen. A bit like uh, SQL Plus, where you say select time, you get a nicely formed report. We lack 
the new SQL plus, like SQL CL that comes uh, with the SQL developer, you can choose a number of formatting. This here just gives us this simple columnar format, uh, nicely readable. But of course, in application, we think it will be different. You will actually um, get a result set and then use a result set, a result set print, just maybe print the first 10 results only, so print 10. Iterate through the results. Oscar also will talk about that, how, how this is done in particular. But really, you see like uh, what you see here is pretty much like JDBC again, a JDBC result set, extracting the, um, the values of all the, uh, the, the uh, columns uh, that are returned and then doing something with them, like uh, you know, printing them on the screen or, or animating some, some graphic with it, and eventually close the result set. Closing the result set, by the way, is important because if you forget to close it, well, then that result set will stay away, will stay, will stay around in the server, and so we eat up memory. So make sure you always close result set. Make sure also you always close a session when you are done working with the, with the graph. Um, also, just like SQL and JDBC, there are bind variables you can use. It's good for several things. First of all, take yourself from uh, SQL injection, a like PGQ injection in this case. It also makes things more interesting, more, more efficient, because then you prepare the PGQ statement once, and then you can execute that statement multiple times with different bind variables. All right, so this is all pretty much like JDBC. Now, another user, another execution environment is Cytoscape itself. Last session, we talked about viewing graphs and we showed Cytoscape. We also showed a demonstration of, of what Cytoscape can do. But Cytoscape, uh, as a reminder, is an open source tool. It's originally designed for biological research, hence the name Cytoscape. That has like a medical touch. Um, it's actually now a general platform for any graph analytics and visualization. It comes as desktop, uh, which is what you see the picture of uh, on, the, on the screen. There's also a JavaScript uh, library that can be used for building a web-based application. And very nicely, it's extensible via plugins or via applications. And that's what we did. So we defined uh, our own plugin that we make available for you. We do not distribute Cytoscape. That's something you have to do yourself. But you can uh, freely use our uh, plugin or extensibility. And when that is done, Cytoscape can now do all sorts of things like uh, run uh, analytics in the, uh, in the uh, uh, <clears throat> property graph service server, the memory analytics engine, but you can also execute PGQL. And, and now you have like a sort of um, GUI where you enter PGQL, run the PGQL, you can save the PGQL, load from a saved file, and execute it, and then get results. And these results can then even be visual. That's what I was what I had to say. So now I'm going to hand it over to uh, Oscar, who's going to guide us to the uh, inside of PGQL and uh, explain how the language works and what you can do with it. So Oscar, it's up to you. I guess you want to All take right. over and share your screen. Yeah, if you could I'm stop sharing. Stop yeah. my sharing. Let's go. Okay, I think you can see this, right? Good, we have it. All right, so now Aubert has given a nice introduction in how to execute PGQL queries, either through APIs or on our visualization. Um, gonna, now we're gonna have a deep dive into PGQL, so we're gonna look into the language, what are all the constructs that you can use and uh, to, to do your analysis. So first an overview of PGQL. Uh, PGQL has three uh, core, core features. So first of all, the syntax is SQL-like. So wherever there's overlap SQL, like projection or grouping or order by, it basically has the same syntax as, as SQL, which provides a lot of familiarity for uh, people. Um, the second thing is it has a graph pattern matching using this SQLart syntax. So if we look at this query on the right-hand side of the screen, you see a, uh, a graph pattern in the match clause where we start from a person P1, and then we follow two friends of edges into a person P2. So since we follow two friends of edges, means that we find friends of friends of person one. And then we output the name of the uh, friend of the friend, which is P2.name. Um, this is a fixed graph pattern because it has a fixed number of uh, edges and vertices, namely two edges and two vertices. But 
Um, the third uh, core feature of PGL is that it is uh, has very powerful recursive path expressions. And recursive means that you don't have a fixed number of edges and vertices, but that you can have an arbitrary number. So as we will see on the next slide, you can, for example, put uh, one of these uh, cleany stars, and this means that you uh, follow zero or more edges. Um, and this kind of recursive path expressions you can use to uh, detect a circular cache flow and fraud detection or do a network uh, impact analysis or all kinds of other use cases that requires this basically arbitrary hop uh, traversal. So here on the right hand side we see an example graph and this graph has two types of vertices. The uh, tangular vertices are uh, devices in an electric network and then the devices are connected uh, uh, to other devices through a connector vertex. So if we look at the topmost vertex, we see a rectangle and then an edge with a property, with a, it's, it's a property that indicates the status of the connection and it is open, the connection is open. And then the, uh, the triangle is a connector and then it connects to a number of other connectors through this connector. And now we wanna do some impact analysis. For example, we wanna know starting from this device that we see at the top, what are all the devices we can reach by following only connections that are open and not connections that are closed. So in this example on the right, it means that we can, starting from the source device, we can find all the devices that are, that are green, but not the devices that are gray because there's only a closed connection between the green and the gray uh, parts. So on the left, we see the PGKL query for doing this, uh, expressing this query. So if we start, um, at, if we look at, we, we see select from, met, where, group by, order by. So this is all very similar to SQL, but let's, uh, let's start uh, at the from clause. So here we say, what is the graph that we want to, uh, that we want to uh, query. And um, um, depending on what API you use, sometimes you actually need to state the graph, other times it's already known from the context which graph you're querying, so you can leave away the from clause, but here we're using it just to be explicit. Okay, now we start. The, the query is um, rather than starting from a single source device, it starts from all devices N, so the n is a ver uh, variable with the nickname that contains regulator. So we do a reg x, regular expression, a string expression to find all devices n that are regulators. And now starting in device n, we want to find all devices m that are connected to zero or more connects to path. And if you look on the right hand side, you can see that the device is connected to another device by following two edges. First, you need to follow an incoming open edge to a connector device, uh, vertex, and then follow another outgoing open uh, edge into the device. So there's always two edges to follow, to hop from one device to another. And to express this kind of more complicated uh, path, because now we want to repeat this kind of, these two hops, we want to repeat zero or more times. That's why we have this cleany star. The cleany star says zero more times, but what exactly do we want to follow zero more times? Uh, this is expressed in this path expression at the top of the query. So we see path connects to, and this expresses that we start in a device from, we follow an incoming edge into a connector uh, vertex, and then another outgoing edge into a, a device vertex. And we want to say that the edge C1 and the edge C2, they both have the status uh, with the value open, so we don't want to follow closed connections. And after having defined this path, you can use it in the met clause. So the connects to in the met clause basically instantiates the connects to that is uh, defined at the top of the query. And now after having done this uh, met and where clause, we end up with a with a number of uh, uh, devices that are that are reachable. So these are all the green devices. And then in this query, now, now you can do whatever you want with this set of devices. Maybe you wanna, you wanna find out like, oh, these are the devices that are reachable. So 
how many how many are there or with which devices are not reachable or is this what we expect or not but in, in this particular query what we do is we just count the number of devices that can be reached from a particular source so if we uh, look at the bottom of the uh, slide we see that there are uh, five results so this means that there are five source devices that match the regular expression there are basically five regulators in this uh, in this graph and then because we group by n so we group by the regulator um, we only get five results five groups one for each regulator and then we we in the select clause we output the nickname of the device and we also count the number of uh, m and here m is the number of repo devices so what we can see in this result is that uh, for example the first uh, device regulator b or e g 2 a it can starting from that device it can reach uh, 1596 other devices so it is connected to 59 uh, 1596 devices in this network so here we do a comparison between uh, pgk and sql because mm, you can express uh, queries the same queries that you can express in pgk also in sql but it's very uh, complicated uh, especially when it comes to this uh, recursive analysis uh, in sql you would need to use recursive sql and this the query easily becomes very complex so here i actually the pgk query i made a little bit simpler than on the previous slide but even for this more simple query you can see that the corresponding sql query is very complex So now I'm going to um, go into all the different features of the language one by one. Uh, first, starting with a basic example. So again, we see a query with select from Netsware. And this query finds all the people who are known by friends of Ember. So if you look at this graph here at the bottom left, we see that there are three person vertices, 100, 200, and 300. And there's one company vertex, and the company name is Oracle. And now the query, we want to find all people who are known by friends of Ember. So Ember is there at the, at the top left, Vertex 100. And then all people are known by friends of Ember. So friends of Ember are Paul and Heather, Vertex 200 and 300, because they have a friend of connection from incoming from Ember. And all people who are known by friends of Ember would then be, um, because Heather is the friend of Paul, that's why this is a match. So if we look at the query, we start from V1, V1 with an ember. We follow an outgoing adds friends off into a person V2. So this is the friend. And then V2 knows V3. So if we match this in the graph, we see that this V1 matches with ember because, because of the uh, V1.n equals ember constraint. And then there are two matches for V2. Um, so because there's two outgoing friend of edges to Paul and to Heather. But in the end, there's only one solution because if you, if you start from Heather, there's no outgoing nose edge. Only if you start from Paul, there's an outgoing nose edge. So therefore there's only one solution, which is Amber matches to V1, Paul matches to V2, and Heather matches to V3. Uh, here again is a is is a similar graph, but a little bit more vertices. And now it has slight edges. So we see that Peter likes Paul, or I'm sorry, Paul likes Peter. And there's also has father and has mother relationships. So we see, for example, that the father of Peter or that the mother of Peter is uh, Rita. And now in this query, we uh, see a regular path expression. So there's a plus, like uh, before I showed this star, a star means zero or more. And here we see a plus and that means uh, one or more. So what this query does is um, it finds all common ancestors of Peter. So X, X is a person with name Peter. So this only matches the, the vertex here at the bottom right. And then we wanna find all ancestors of Peter. 
by following has parents one or more times. And then we want to find all y that have the same ancestor. And ancestor is again one of these pet expressions that's uh, defined here at the top of the query. And it says that a has parent uh, pet starts at the child vertex and then follows either a has father or a has mother at, uh, at labeled uh, has father or has mother into a parent. So if we look at this example, what we will get is three results. So first, starting at Peter, um, we can see that it has two ancestors, Rita, which is his mother, as well as Paul, which is his grandfather. And now we want to find all vertices that have a common ancestor. Well, first of all, Rita has a common ancestor because Paul is the common ancestor between Rita and Peter. Dwight is also a person with a common ancestor because Dwight has Paul as common ancestor. But as you can see, Dwight appears twice because Dwight not only has Paul as common ancestor with Peter, but it also has Rita as common ancestor with Peter. Um, so, so having a closer look into the different classes. So the select class is similar to SQL. It's a projection, a tabular projection of the results with rows and columns. And in the select class, you can have one or more expressions and you can use this alias and you can say S. You can do some expression and you can say S and then you can give it some variable name. And this variable name is what will be the column name when you print it. And you can also use the same column name when you want to access the uh, the column in the uh, through, through the results of the API. You can add this distinct uh, modif modifier so that it will uh, remove distinct rows. So if we go back to this previous query, it will not remove any row because every row is distinct. Even though these are almost the same, they differ in the last column. So if you apply distinct to this query, it will actually still give the same result. Uh, the from and the met the from clause allows you to specify the input graph. And then a met clause uh, specifies the graph pattern. So here we see a graph named G, and then we match the pattern N outgoing edge E to vertex M on top of that graph G. And then in the where clause, you can filter out things. So you can uh, express all kinds of expressions. For example, you can say N dot property needs to be greater than or smaller than something. And you can use familiar uh, operators like uh, arithmetic operators like plus, minus, uh, multiplication, relational operators, logical operators, etc. So here's a, an overview of all the different uh, constructs that you can use in the MET clause. So the parentheses uh, are used to match a vertex. So here we match a vertex. And V1 is really just a, a variable name. So you can use whatever variable name you want. And if there are no constraints on the vertex, like in this case, there's no, it doesn't say what label it has, it doesn't say any sort of filter. So it will just match any vertex in the graph and will assign those vertices the variable name V1. Uh, the second one uh, matches outgoing edges. Uh, and here it gives the variable name E1. The third one matches incoming edges, and the fourth one matches edges in either direction. So if you start at N, it would match both incoming and outgoing edges to any of its neighbors. Sometimes you don't really care about assigning a variable to a vertex or edge, so you can leave away the variable name. So in these next four, uh, four rows, you see a vertex without a variable name, and also the edges without variable names. Especially often you just want to you, you just want to test if there is a vertex between some edges, but you don't really care about selecting using the vertex in the select clause or outputting properties of it. So therefore, you can leave away the variable name. And then these bottom two show how you can uh, say, okay, this vertex v1 should have label label one, or it should have label label two. And similarly for edges, you can say uh, this edge should have uh, the label label one. And, and also there you can, for, for edges, you can say it should have this label or that label. And on the right-hand side, 
So on the left hand side, we see how we can map vertices and edges. On the right hand side, we can see we have these path expressions, and path expressions can match multiple edges at once. So the top one, and, and the, the semantics of these path matches is that it tests whether there exists a path from A to B, from some from vertex to another vertex that satisfies this regular expression. So the first regular expression just tests does there exist a path from some vertex to another vertex, uh, following only a single single edge with label LBL label. And then we have all these different combinations where we say the, the second one says, I want to follow zero or more edges labeled label, or I want to uh, follow one or more, which is the plus. Uh, the question mark says, I want to follow zero or more edges. And then we also have this one with the curly braces. The one with the two says, with only the two in it, says like, I want to follow exactly two edges. Two comma says, I want to follow two or more edges. Two comma three says, I want to follow two to three. So that means only two or three. And the last one says uh, up to three. So that can be either zero, one, two, or three edges. And then we can do grouping and aggregation in a very similar way as in the SPL. So using group by, you can, you can group the intermediate solutions and then you can use aggregations afterwards in the select clause or order by clause. So count, uh, count the number of um, rows and min, max, sum and average to uh, computations on uh, numeric, for example, to get the minimum or the maximum or the sum of uh, a set of numbers. Um, min and max can also be used on string. So if you want to get the minimum or maximum string, and it would output the string with the, which is ordered like uh, lexicographically the highest or the lowest. Inside the aggregations, you can use distinct. Um, for example, you can say, if, if you do a pattern match, there could be multiple vertices with the same, with the same property. For example, two people may have the same birthday. And if you use, for example, count distinct uh, birthday, it would only count the distinct birthdays, so it would not uh, count all birthdays. And having class, you can use after group by to filter out groups, entire groups of solutions. So here we filter out groups of we filter out groups that have more than ten elements. So let's have a look at this example query here. Um, on the right, we see a graph that has two types of vertices. It has movies and it has customers. And for example, the vertex 200 and 300, they are movies vertices, and the uh, other vertices 100, 400, and 500 are customer vertices. And this data is extracted from some uh, some, some online web uh, website that uh, maintains movie uh, data. And it recorded which uh, customers clicked on which movies. So we see, uh, if you look at the top left, we see that Maria is a customer who clicked on the movie uh, Yes Man, and she also clicked on the movie uh, Matt's Point. And now, if we look at this query, we what it does is for each movie return the time of the most recent click. Um, so as you can see, there's two movies. So if we say met m m dot type is movie, it will match both of these movies. So unless you specify a constraint that says like uh, m dot title equals met point, or m dot title equals yes m, if you don't do that, it will match both movies. So and for each movie, return the time of the most recent click. So, so let, let's have let's have a look at the uh, movie met point first, which is the first 200. As you can see, it has three clicks. Click zero, click two, click three. And each of these clicks have a timestamp attached to them. And now we want to return the most recent click. Um, so if you look at these dates, the most recent one would be the, the one with the highest value for the uh, time. And this is the uh, click three because it has time 2000, 2012. So therefore, if you look at the result, the movie match point, which is the second result, uh, wait for each movie return the time of the most recent click. So I think the um, the slide has an error here because it's I think it's it's it should take the max which is 2012. 
but it somehow takes the 2010, it's taking the minimum. So this should be the 2012. And if we look at YesMan, there's only two clicks. Uh, wait, YesMan has only one click, which is from no, Costa no, Maria. Correct. I think it is correct. It is correct. Yeah, just the, the, the titles are reversed. So match point is the second one. And match point, that's the most recent. So 2010, 12, 17. And for yes man, there's only one, so it's it is correct. It shows that it's maybe swapped the lines are in the reverse order or something. Okay. Yeah. Um Okay, let me go to the next one. Uh here we see uh have a have a better look at order by limit and offset. So order by allows you to sort the rows and limit and offset allow you to uh, basically paginate. You can say something like, I want to I wanna get the first 10 results or I want to get results 10 to 20 or 20 to 30. Um, so if we have a look at this example query, so we're using the same graph, the movies graph. So we say from movies graph. And then we match all vertices n. Because now what we want to do in this query is uh, find all find all customers and order them by their uh, sort them by the first name and then return the first two results. So because n dot n will match every customer, so there's one one hundred is customer Maria, five hundred is customer Franklin, and then four hundred is customer Isana. So it will match these three vertices, and then we order by the first name. Um, and then first, the, the, and then we limit two, so we only output two. So the first one will be Franklin, because it starts with an F, and then Exana, which is the next one in the uh, ordering. And only then we get Maria, but Maria is uh, not shown up because we, we limit by two, two rows only. Um, here we see an overview of all the data types that you can use. So on the previous slide, we already saw some usage of uh, timestamp data, and as well as uh, I think some string data, the, the names of the persons, they were strings. But there's a whole set of other data types that you can use, like numeric data types, integer, long, float, double, there's a Boolean data type, and then these last five, they are date time data types. So dates, times, time stamps, as well as time with time zone and time stamp with time zone. And either properties can be of these types, but in order to match the properties, you can you can use these PGK literals. So in the query, you would say n dot string property equals Franklin, or n dot numeric property equals two thousand. And similar for dates and times, you can. You can use these kind of literals in order to match dates and times. You can also do all kinds of conversions between types. So numeric types, like some of these types, they implicitly convert. So if you compare numeric property, uh, integer property to a long property, it will automatically work. It will just convert the integer to a long before doing the, uh, the computation. But for other, other comparison, it would throw an error. So if you compare an integer to a string. For example, you say 2000 equals Franklin. It will, it will throw an error because by default, you cannot compare between such types. But if you want, you can cost types. So if you know that a particular string is a Boolean, you can basically cost this string in the Boolean and then you get through out of it. Or if we have a string here, it encodes 2.50, 2.50. And then we know, okay, this is double, so let's cast it into a double. And similar for all these other data types, we can do all kinds of conversions. So this is an overview of which conversions are allowed. So we can all we can always convert to or from a string from any data type. Um, and for the rest, you can do several con um, conversions uh, between data systems. For example, we have this timestamp here, and now we want to convert this into a date. And what happens basically, 
if you do if you do this it basically just drops the time part so sometimes you're only interested in the date part so you can you can use this cost to just get the date out or similarly you can get the time out by costing the timestamp into a time and if you want this may not be as useful as the one above but you can also cost uh, dates or times into a timestamp and it will if you do this uh, a date into a timestamp it will just uh, fill it out with uh, zeros so it will take midnight if you cost a time into a timestamp it will take the uh, the current date so if today is 2nd of october and you do this cost today it will give you 2nd of october there and then pitch has a as a set of building functions Mm, first of all, it has uh, this function ID, which gives you the identifier of vertex or edge. Um, it has this function has label to test whether a vertex or edge has a label. So you can already inside the pattern, like you see on the right, you can say P1 colon person. This already allows you to say that this P1 should have the label person, but alternatively, or if you want to Combine like make make more complex expressions out of it. You can you can use this has label expression in the where clause to say uh, it should have ha it should uh, have this label but not that label, or maybe it should have both this label and that label but not that label. <clears throat> okay, and if we look at the third building function labels, this returns the uh, set of labels of the vertex, and similarly there's a function label to return the label of an edge. There's this function all different. And this is very easy way to say that all the vertices or edges should be different. So often, if you look at, at the right, we see that we match uh, three person vertices, P1, P2, P3. And sometimes we wanna say that we, we don't want P1, P2 and P3 to match to the same person. So by default, it will match to the same person unless you specify a constraint like this. P1 not equals P2, P1 not equals P3, and P2 not equals P3. But this gets pretty lengthy if there would be more vertices that you don't want to be uh, different, the same. So therefore you can use this all different function to say in one go, okay, all these vertices are different. And then you can also use function in degree and out degree to get the number of incoming or outgoing edges of a vertex. And you can use this uh, Java rec rec regular X, rec X to uh, do a regular string uh, matching. So now we're going to have a look at a little bit more complicated uh, examples. So PGL also has subqueries. So it has these uh, two kinds of subqueries. The first one is exist subquery. So inside the where clause, you can put this exist uh, predicate. And inside there, you can put a subquery. You can have another select and a met and whatever other group by or order by you want to put in there. And this allows you to th say something like, okay, I want to match this pattern, but there doesn't exist this other pattern. So if we look at this example, we want to find A, which is a, and then follow friend of, friend of, to um, another vertex. So this, uh, which will be a friend of friend, matches all friend of friend. So since A is uh, Peter, named Peter, we met all the friends of friends of Peter. But what may happen is that uh, the friend of the friend is also a friend of Peter. So it could be that Peter has a direct edge to friend of friend, and it also has two edges to friend of friend. And we want to, if we want to say we don't, we are not interested in finding finding these combinations. We can say, okay, where not exist, Peter is friend of friend of friend. So this makes sure we're really only finding friend of friends. This is just a tip, like you can actually also express this query in an easier way. So you can say a friend of two, friend of friend, here at the bottom, and then you don't actually need to use this exist. But it was just to give uh, an, an easy example. Um, even you can use this exist anywhere where you can uh, use filters, or where you can use uh, expressions. So even in the select clause or in the order by clause, you can say like order by where there exists some pattern. But here we see um, a filter. Uh, we, here we see an exist inside the path. So what this uh, query does is, uh, it is a query over a uh, a graph that represents a code base. So we have in the code we have functions that call other functions. And um, here, what we want to do is 
we want to see, starting from function f1, where it says name func1, we want to find all functions f2 that are called from function f1, but none of the, uh, there is no global write happening. So what this means, we want to find functions that call other functions here at, at the top, if we look at the path expression, and that doesn't exist for each function along the path, which is what we call dest, which is a destination. There doesn't exist a call, a transitive call to a function which writes to a global variable. So this is quite a complex ex uh, expression. We basically say from f1 to f2, there should exist a path, but along this path, there doesn't exist a path to a global variable. So you can do quite, quite complicated, uh, complex queries with this. And finally, the second type of subquery are scalar subqueries. So you don't have to, we're not going to go into the full details of this query, but this is a query from a, a, an LDBC benchmark, which is a, a popular graph benchmark. And what it does is uh, for each person in the graph, see which messages it has created and then the texts that are uh, belong to that message. And then for each of these messages, we want to, or for, for each of these persons, we want to count the number of messages he created. And we want to count the uh, number of likes that that message received, that, that the message, all the messages that the person created received. And we also want to find the number of replies that all the messages that the particular person received got. So then we get this more complex query where in the select clause we have two scalar subqueries. And these scalar subqueries basically using bindings already obtained from the outer query, like message uh, here is probably comes from the outer queries passed into the inner query. It does an additional pattern match. And then it does some aggregation. So here it does a count aggregation and then it returns a single single result. And this is done used in the outer query to do some more computation with that. And this is also a more complex uh, Cartesian product, a uh, more complex operation that you don't typically need. Um, but you can do it if you want. So you can, in the Mets class, you can have multiple patterns and these are connected. So here we have a pattern C1 and we have another pattern C2, click M to M. And because there's no overlap between the variables, like the C1 and C2 are different. What, what basically happens is we first met C1 and then we met the other pattern, C1, M, and then we create a Cartesian product between these matches. So here C1 matches only Maria, but C2 matches Maria, Ixana, and Franklin. So the Cartesian product is this times that. You get this out of it. Um, so here I, I will go over uh, quite, quite fast because uh, Albert already covered this. So this shows all the APIs for uh, executing uh, PGQL queries, either through this query PGQL or the PGX session query of PGQL. Depending on if you have an, uh, if you already have a handle to a graph, you can leave away the from clause. Otherwise, you should use this PGX session query PGQL, and then you need to pass a from a from clause into. Otherwise, it doesn't know which graph to query. You can print results using uh, the print. Um, there's two ways for iterating over results. So first there is um, kind of the Java way where you use uh, this column. So it, it uses an iterator. And then you can get the results one by one inside a for loop. And there's also this more JDBC way where you can say you basically get a cursor into the uh, result set and you need to call next every time. And then it would, whenever you call next, it would the cursor would go to the next uh, row and then you can simply say results that get string, and then because it knows that which row it is, it knows which uh, which cell to get out of the result set. Uh, prepared statements. There's two reasons for using prepared statements. First, because it's a uh, it's it's for safety for your application to keep your application safe. Because if you would use string concatenation in your application, then users of your application may may actually insert like parts of a query, like where you expect maybe first name, the user will actually insert a string 
which is a part of a query. And then suddenly, because you use this concatenation, the, the actual query will, will change. And then the user may get access to things he's not uh, supposed to. But so besides safety uh, reason, there's also it actually uh, is useful to use because it will speed up query compilation because whenever you use this prepared statement, so here we see an example query which is uh, prepared, which you can say like prepare this query. Um, and you only have to do this once and it will do the comp computation only once and then you can reuse the, uh, the, comp the, the compiled query multiple times. So this will actually speed up uh, subsequent executions of the query. And what you can do, for example, you compile this query once and then you can say, first I want to insert first name, I don't know, Oscar, and then first name Albert, and then the next one you insert some uh, other first name. So here we see an example, we prepare this query, and then we set the bind variable. So going back to the previous slide, these bind variables are the question marks. So this query has two question marks. And then this sets the, okay, this is an, an, for another query, but it basically sets the first question mark to the uh, value x, y, z, and the second question mark to the value 100, and the third to the value 2,898, et cetera. And then you can execute it, and then you can change the values. Like you only have to prepare the statement once. You set the values, you execute it, and change the values and execute it again. Um, this just goes over the date time data types. So whenever you go back to Java, then these date time data types in PGL become Java classes. And here's just an overview of how the types in PGL correspond to the types in Java. So a date is called a local date in Java, time is called a local time, etc. cetera. Um, here we see, um, uh, Basically, there's two implementations of PGL. You can either execute PGL in the in-memory analyst, PGX, or you can execute PGL in the Oracle or RDBMS. And depending on what your use case is, it may be better to do one or the other. So uh, PGX, or the, 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 the top one, in-memory analyst, because it's uh, all in-memory, this is extreme, extremely performant. Um, so if you want to do like heavy, heavy uh, work, like uh, like analysis that take like a long time, you they are best done in memory. And another benefit of using in-memory analysts is that it, that you can combine the queries with graph algorithms because the uh, PGX has a bunch of built-in algorithms like uh, PageRank. Uh, you can also do limited property updates in memory. So you can update properties, but for example, you cannot easily update uh, vertices and edges, like insert new vertex or insert new edge. Um, the only way to do this is through this delta update, which you see on the right here. So you can, the Oracle RDBMS, there you can easily add new vertices and edges or remove vertices and edges. And then PGX will synchronize through this delta update. It will maybe like every 10 seconds or whatever you configure, it will update the in-memory instance. But this is not as as as, as quickly as uh, as things as updates can be done in RDBMS. So that's one of the benefits of using RDBMS. If you have frequent updates, so you have like uh, updates, like if you only have like a few updates per minute, then it doesn't matter. But if you have constant updates, it may be best to use the uh, RDBMS. Another benefit of RDBMS is that it, uh, it stores the graph as a set of triples. So it's, it's completely schema-less. You don't have to care about schema. And it can also query large data that don't fit into the, into the memory of a single machine. All right, and then I'm passing it back to uh, Gene, who is uh, going to show us the resources and conclude. Um, Great. Uh, uh, thanks a lot, Oscar, um, for taking us through the deep dive of the various capabilities that are built into PGQL. So it's obvious um, you can really do a lot <laughs> with it. Uh, and it's pretty versatile uh, language that's um, accessible to developers. So uh, Oscar, before we do the resources, we did get one question on the chat uh, a little early on, a question about whether the electric network example was taken from a real world uh, product or a project. Well, I'm not sure where it actually comes from. 
uh, I, I I know it is, it's actually available on the PGX website, so you can download it. So, um, but I, I don't know actually where it comes from. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks, Oscar. And I do know of customers who are actually using graph analytics for things like network intrusion detection, which is uh, sort of similar. But um, yeah. A lot of interesting applications of graph technologies, for sure. Uh, so yeah, great. Um, uh, the, Oscar, you can go to the next slide. Thanks. So um, we are preparing in the next three weeks for Oracle's flagship conference. Uh, most of you are aware that every year we have the Open World Conference in San Francisco. Uh, just a uh, uh, note for folks who are familiar with open world from past years. You also may be familiar with the Oracle Code 1 series of conferences that have been uh, specifically geared toward developers. And this year at Open World, we're combining Code 1, which also includes the former Java 1 sessions, with the standard open world sessions. So it'll be a great conference with just uh, offerings for um, both uh, business types as well as uh, for developers. And we're very pleased to announce that we have a ton of graph sessions and demos going on during the week, uh, some of the topics you see listed here. So uh, if it's possible, we hope to see you at Open World. And you can just take a look at more spatial and graph sessions at the URL at the bottom of the screen as well. Uh, next slide, Oscar. Also, a uh, plug for our flagship analytics and data summit. This is a spring conference in March for three days held at Oracle headquarters, which has a specific focus on analytics, big data, machine learning, as well as a full set of tracks on spatial and graph technologies. So uh, mark your calendars for that. And if you have a use case that you'd like to present at the conference, the call for speakers is open. So check out the URL at the bottom of the screen for that. Uh, next slide. Here's some more resources on the graph technologies. We have our official product pages that have a lot of white papers, documentation, as well as videos, uh, some blogs with current content on developer tips and tricks. Uh, and we also have many videos, YouTube channels that are specifically geared towards developers getting started with graph technologies. And for those of you who'd like to get down and dirty with the technologies, we do offer a VM, a Big Data Lite virtual machine that's also free for download with uh, some graphs as well as many other technologies. So uh, next slide. And finally, uh, feel free to follow us on Twitter and we have two vibrant uh, user group communities on LinkedIn and Google+. Uh, just search for Oracle Spatial and Graph Community and feel free to join the community uh, at those sites. Uh, so we're almost at the top of the hour. We'll make uh, one last call if anyone has any questions they want to enter into the chat. Okay, uh, I don't see any further questions. So um, any closing thoughts, uh, Albert or Oscar? No, I think this was interesting. I like this kind of presentation, it's very clear. Oh, somebody's asking just the compliment. Yeah. Yeah, great, okay. great. So uh, Oscar, if you could uh, advance yeah. uh, the slide. So uh, to close out, um, uh, bookmark our Property Graph Ask Tom session page. And we'll have another session in November with a topic to be announced. Again, view the recordings there, submit any feedback. And if you have any requests for specific topics, feel free to enter those there and we'll take a look. So we look forward to seeing everybody in November. Um, thanks for attending. And uh, we'll close it out. Have a great evening.
uh, or a great day. So bye, everybody. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.